What is anti-design? I like to define anti-design as a way of thinking. I feel like it's, it's a mindset more than anything. Anti-design usually arises when there's a reaction to something, whether it's something like capitalism or, you know, like modernism or designers just kind of looking to break free from traditional industry standards that are kind of apparent at the time. Anti-design happens when a designer makes a clear intention to just challenge what's traditional, you know, without, without knowing a designer's true intention, it's difficult to categorize it as anti-design. And so here on the screen here, I've got some designers that have played a key role in anti-design throughout various design movements, you know, design movements like futurism, Dada, constructivism, new wave, deconstructivism, and grunge typography movements, which is kind of, you know, what we, what, what we consider anti-design today. Um, I think kind of David Carson is kind of behind a lot of that stuff. All right. So here are some different styles and motifs of anti-design. So we've got, you know, intentional, just kind of disorder here, some, some bold, bold and contrasting colors, distorted type texture montage. I believe this is a piece from David Carson as well. Deconstructed elements, which is a piece from, I believe, Wolfgang Wangart or something like that. Uh, I think he's known as the father of kind of new wave. And then we've got some overlapping elements, overlapping elements being one of the styles and motifs. And this piece here is from Art Chantry. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. This piece here is from Art Chantry as well. Uh, and it's a screen print on paper. We've got some distorted type here by, I believe it's Kifri Kiti, I think. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right as well, but these are just some common styles and motifs within anti-design. How are, how are y'all feeling about these? Do y'all like these designs? Like, let me know some. Adam A says, definitely like the intentional order, intentional disorder. But yeah, these are just some styles and motifs commonly found within anti-design. So yeah, I think a lot of these designers were definitely kind of doing this stuff intentionally. I don't know about Carson. I know David Carson. One thing that he said is, or not David Carson, actually. So David Carson actually worked on, he worked on Ray Gun, but the founder of Ray Gun said, you know, they weren't trying to do anything. They weren't trying to, you know, like make people upset. You know, they were just kind of being themselves when it came to just kind of the covers of Ray Gun, just like the different things that they implemented within Ray Gun magazine. And so, you know, I think, you know, that's a, that's a different idea there, you know, as opposed to, you know, designing intentionally, you know, to make it look kind of weird. Pank, Panky says, what would we, that's a funny name. What would we consider motifs here? These intentional disorder, deconstructed elements. So how they're taking the typefaces here and just kind of like obscuring them, cutting them up you know, rearranging them, putting them back together. This right here, this texture montage, these are just common styles or common themes that you would find throughout anti-design. I'm going to go on to the next slide. And so before we break the rules, you know, we got to, we got to learn them. You know what I mean? And so here are just some of the common rules, common graphic design principles that you learn about, like whenever you go to design school or something, you know, everybody knows about, you know, alignment, balance, color harmony, contrast hierarchy, um, white space, you know, we implement grids to, you know, so that there's a sense of organization amongst the layouts. But here's a list of gestalt principles as well. Although these, these are more of ideas than rules, I would say, they, they still kind of, they still kind of play a part in, in graphic design and kind of how we design things and make them visually appealing to, to the user. And so closure, I could probably run through these. Let me see here. So yeah, closure is how our eye fills in the gaps to incomplete objects. So, you know, if I had like, if I had like a good example would be, I want to say like the, what's a logo, maybe like the Apple logo or something, how it's got the chunk missing out of it, you know, but you still perceive that as an Apple. I think that's probably a good example of, of closure, common fate states that, you know, multiple objects traveling in the same direction are perceived as a group. Continuity is when our eye perceives elements as a continuous flow rather than individual elements. 
figure ground is the ability to distinguish an object from its background, which I always talk about this, but a, a good a good example of figure ground would be the FedEx logo, like how you see the arrow in it. I remember when the first time I, I realized that it just blew my mind. But um, yeah, and then let's see, number number five here, or not number five, but I believe number 12 is when objects that are closer together are perceived as being related. So that's proximity. So, you know, if you've got, if you've got two or three objects, you know, on the left hand side, you know, and then you've on the other hand side, you have a different set of objects. Those, you know, those are two different sets of objects, you know, and they're perceived as being related, although they're individual elements on each side. And so similarity would also be like the idea that objects of the same color, shape, size, or texture are said to be more related to each other than those that aren't of the same size, color, or texture. Y'all got any thoughts about uh, thoughts about the rules? Did I leave any out? Y'all let me know. All right. If y'all can't think of none, I'm going to just move on. All right. Next up, let's see. All right. And here are some examples of anti-design kind of before the trend. We've got some work from Chris Ashworth here who I think he picked up things after David Carson left from being the art director at Raygun. So I think he he became the art director at Raygun shortly after. And then we have Raul Hausman here, who is a key figure within the Dada movements. Another piece from Raul Hausman down here as well. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. And then we have Filippo Tommaso, who is said to be the founder of the Futurist Movement. And then we've got April Greenman, who is one of the leaders of the new wave kind of design style, which is a style, I believe if I'm correct, is a style that kind of rose to prominence in kind of, a, kind of rose to prominence to just kind of challenge, I believe, kind of Swiss design. And so kind of futurism kind of came from that, but not for futurism, but no, actually I'm getting those confused, I'm sorry. It's been a long day. I'm really tired, but yeah, let's see. And then next we have some examples of how designers are utilizing similar styles today. So, you know, going back, you know, to kind of some of my first thoughts, some of my first thoughts, anti-design is more of a way of thinking than a specific style. So, you know, anti-design doesn't really have a clear look or identity to it. It's completely up to the designer. You know, some anti-designs have a subtle coherence to them and, you know, some don't. So let's, let's get into it. And here is design work from some of the designers today that are kind of doing similar like anti-design styles. So we've got some work from Philip Winley here on Cassier. I am Dr. Milan, K. Kwan, Craft. How are y'all feeling about these? Are these anti-design? Ashton WJ says Dada was an interesting period to learn about. They did a lot of wild things outside of design as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to include Marcel. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Duchamp. Duchamp. And this as well, because I think he's got a good representation of anti-design with his ready mades and stuff, but I don't know if that applies to graphic design as, as much as it does art. So left, left that one out. But yeah, how are we, how are we feeling about these chat? Do y'all have a favorite? I really like Philip Winley's work over here. We've got like kind of a mix of just like different typefaces and stuff. You know what I mean? Which, you know, it's kind of, you know, frowned upon, but you know, anti-design is about doing what you want. So who cares? I like this piece from Dr. Milan over here. Very, very, very David Carson with kind of the what I would say maybe like texture mashing a little bit, like just, you know, very analog, just finding different elements and just kind of like placing them down within like a, within a box and just kind of seeing what works and just layering things on top of each other. True Hutton says, I like a cat's work. Or is that? Oh yeah, yeah, this is cool. And I feel like this here definitely has like some subtle kind of, there's like a subtle cohesion there you know what i mean like it's it ignores like a good amount of the design principles but it still works you know as well i feel like a lot of these do that appreciate you pf2 adam a says yeah i feel like we can't copy or replicate 
their designs, which is very cool. I like Anja Cassier's work. Yeah, this is really cool. I could see like Nike using something like this. Maybe maybe they've worked with Nike. Who knows? Cole says K Kwan with the blurred frog. Yeah. Nah, this is dope. I I mean the frog is just like super cute. So, you know, I would I would love to have this in the house somewhere. But yeah, this piece is this piece is dope. Y'all got any more any more thoughts on these? This one from Anja Cassier is really dope as well. I like this piece. Lots of layering, but like the color palette still makes it feel like unified. And I think that's pretty difficult to do. I've I've tried and it is <laughs> it it's it's turned out not so good. Definitely not as good as what is what we have here. All right, if y'all good on these, I'll go to the next one. Adam A says their designs make us observe the poster more to understand their intent intentions if that makes sense yeah i feel like it's um, i feel like with with most of these you know you can kind of tell that there's an a subtle in intention to just kind of like break the grid for lack of a better term you know i feel like in its simplest way you know that's an easy kind of decision for these as to you know whether you're gonna follow a grid or not and i feel like definitely this one has some underlying kind of like structure and like design principles to it as well as the others i think that's a part of what makes it makes it such a unique style is that you know you've got to you you you've, you're you breaking a grid but you've got to you know you've got to have something in there to just kind of make it pop and make it stand out oh i just i hate that i just said make it pop all right i'm gonna go to the next one all right and these are things that remind us of anti-design so what i'm doing here is you know i wanted to highlight kind of professional design work from different agencies diff different kind of renowned agencies that exhibit traits and characteristics characteristics of anti-design but can't be classified as such or i wouldn't classify this design work as anti-design but there is a no to it there so here's some work by pentagram from Pentagram for, I forget who this is for, actually. I know this is work by Lander for Milan Symphony. This is work by Pentagram for, let me see here. Who is this for? I, for? I forget the name of this, but this is also work by Pentagram. Then we've got the Spotify, you know, <laughs> the Spotify rap stuff. Then we've got Neville Brody for Raf Simmons. And then we've got some work by Dia TV or Dia Studios. So what do y'all think about these? Can you spot the subtle kind of nodes to anti-design? I, I mean, with Spotify, it's definitely not subtle. Like they're, they're not being shy about, about that. So can you guys spot any of the common motifs here? F2 says, I love how freely structured they are. Yeah, I really like the one for the symphony here from Landor. I feel like, you know, like the text, like illegible in a, in a way, you know, but, you know, it still works. I feel like that's difficult to do. And I, I would have included the logo, but if you were to see the logo for for the Milan Symphony that Landor created for this kind of for this kind of branding project, it would make sense as to why they kind of did this like overlapping kind of negative space within the text. Ashton WJ says they all have it. Lander with the with the typography. Yeah. PF2 says I used to tilt my phone and look from the bottom up to read the text on the Spotify one. Does that work? Trey Hutton says, Neville is fire. The typography is all over, but it works somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. And I think what makes this work is um, like we, you know, we've also got like some overlapping text here. And then, you know, the justification of this is just all over the place. But there's still kind of a sense of hierarchy at play here you know you've you've got your bold text here then you've got like this it, the entire word here instead of just a single drop cap you know what i mean so that's cool and then you've got your body copy and then you know typical just kind of like full bleed just kind of image on the right hand side but the text here is just interesting enough to kind of you know make make the two just kind of feel like feel like a single unit if i must say like i don't know two says it yeah it plays an an optical illusion adam a says the monochrome image of the guy the body of text is illegible which is interesting yeah yeah anti-design you did says 
anti-design feels like having creative freedom yeah i mean yeah i think that's like the root of it you know it's just to do what you want you know what i mean i don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it you know be beauty is in the eye of the beholder you know what i mean so but yeah do y'all have any y'all have any questions about about this stuff before we hop into the next the next segment Udicta says that's my favorite quote. It's a good one. Trey Hutton says, do you think the random typography stands out more than the guy? Yeah, it's. I think it's the first thing that my eye is drawn to. But, you know, that's just me. It's very bold, you know. And then I feel like the image is kind of a little bit as far as kind of lighting on the softer side. So it doesn't stand out as much as the text. I feel like the, the bold text kind of kind of wins me. When the wind's my eye over first. Well, all right. I guess we're going to get ready for the next segment. Y'all give me a little bit to prepare for the next segment. Mm -hmm.